there was political turmoil, which I suppose is nothing new to us. This period was marked by the assassination of several of the kings of the Northern Kingdom. There were unwise political alliances being made, for example, between the um, Syrians and Israel who were trying to form an alliance to fight off the Assyrians and hoping that the Judean, Judean king would join them as well. So you had all these activities going on. The Assyrians were making inroads into Israelite territory in the Northern Kingdom. So there was a whole upheaval going on at the time politically. And most importantly, Hosea saw that religiously there were many distortions and perversions to their ancient um, religion of Yahwism. And for Hosea, Hosea accused his fellow Israelites of literally abandoning Yahweh, breaking the covenant that God had entered into with them from long ago, and basically depending on the Canaanite deities for their welfare and their material welfare and the abandoned Yahweh. And it is in that context, in that situation, that Hosea is trying to bring a word of comfort, a word of hope, a word of consolation to the people of Israel. And he did this by presenting the mercy of God in a feminine image. So that in verse 4, he says to the Israelites, Zion, sorry, so before I get there, Zion, <coughs> um, one minute, hold on here. Right, so Hosea says to Israel, is there hope for us? Has God abandoned us? And instead, he answers with a response. He says, speaking the words that reassuring them of God's commitment, of God's love for them. He says, I myself taught you Ephraim to walk. I myself took them by the arm, but they did not know that I was the one caring for them. I was leading them with strings of love that with them I was like someone lifting an infant to his cheek and that I bent down to feed them. So Hosea is giving a word of consolation to Israel, captured in the image of a mother taking care of her children. Okay, and the love of the mother, the nurturing love of a mother, the sustaining love of a mother, Father God, is described here by Hosea that this is how God takes care of God's children. So that I, um, Hosea was able in the end to come to the conclusion that there is a future for God's people after all. Yahweh's compassion and his mercy has certainly triumphed over God's fierce anger towards Israel for her abandonment of God and for breaking the covenant with God. So that here Hosea is presenting this word of hope for a future for Israel, spoken by God through the words of the prophets, Hosea, in an image that really speaks of a mother's love, okay? A striking feminine, Im feminine image of God. So that is the first um, context that I'm looking at. Now, how do I see that mercy of God extended to Israel manifested today? In the Catholic Church, in the Family Life Unit, there is a section of that unit which deals with parenting. I believe it's called the Common Sense Parenting Course. And any parish is free to get in touch with them and organize for a group to come to their parish to have these sessions with them, with anyone who would like to attend. In my own parish, we are trying to organize it confirmation candidates so that they too will begin to understand what real parenting is. Parenting after God's own heart. Parenting after the model of God's parenthood. In the Anglican Church, there is a Mother's Union, which is a worldwide organization. And this organization also caters to parenting programs. And these um, members of this um, Mother's Union, they go to any parish as well that would have them, that they can share with them techniques on how to be good parents, parents after God's 
example. This is how was Hosea presented God here in this image. So I go on now to the second image that I have been able to identify in scripture that deals with uh, God's mercy presented in a feminine image. And here I looked at 2nd Isaiah. 2nd Isaiah was active during the time of the exile when the Babylonians had overthrown um, the southern kingdom of Judah and they were already in Babylon for almost 50 years. So he was active towards the end of, coming towards the end of the Babylonian exile. So, close to the end of this dark period, when Israel literally felt that God had forsaken them, never mind that they ended up there because of their own um, turning away from God and abandoning God and breaking the covenant over and over and over, but they were there and they were still crying out to God, God in this God forsaken place, have you forgotten us? So that the prophet Isaiah goes on to ask, he says in verse um, 14, Zion is lamenting the fact that he says, Yahweh has abandoned me. The Lord has forgotten me. And to this, Yahweh responds by posing a question. And the question is, can a woman forget her baby at the breast? Feel no pity for the child she has born? Even if these were to forget, I shall never forget you. Look, I have written your name on the palms of my hands. So that here Isaiah compares the love that God has for Israel to the love that a mother feels when she's breastfeeding her child. I have breastfed my two children. I know the bond, the bond that, that comes about when a mother breastfeeds her child. And I know that that deep love that God felt for Israel is a love that is even greater than the human love that a mother feels for a breastfeeding child. So that you can only imagine the depth of God's love for, uh, for Israel when God says, listen, I have not forgotten you. I could never forget you. Even if your human mother should forget you, I shall never forget you. So as profound as a human mother's love is for her child, Yahweh, the divine mother, his love, that love transcends even the love that, mo that mother has for her child. Okay, so that again it is a word of hope given to Israel who really felt that God had abandoned them. But in truth, in fact, that love that a mother has for her child never dies never dies, particularly if you have breastfed that child. So, where do I see that mercy being manifested today in our society? A couple of years ago, in doing some research for an assignment I was looking on, and uh, I'm just gonna test to this. In the assignment I was doing, I was hoping to prove that if you took a delinquent child and placed that child into a family that is stable, that is loving and caring, that it was possible for behavior to be modified. So I interviewed five families who did exactly that. And even a couple of years ago when I was doing this research, the crime situation was no different from it is today. And many people that I interviewed said to me, Miss, people are not going to take a delinquent youth into their home. Because many families had in some way been touched by a bandit, whether it was directly or indirectly through their extended families, but they all had some sad story to tell about how they were um, a bandit attacked them or stole from them. And Miss, I would never open my house. A delinquent youth. But you know what? I found five families who did just that. That's the mercy of God. You know when a family, a stable, loving Christian family could open their home 
and accept and take into their home a delinquent young man. My, my focus was on young men, not girls. That's a different dynamic altogether. But these families did it. And more, all of them had success stories to tell. When a family is willing to do that, that's the mercy of God. In our neighborhoods, in our parishes, I'm sure there must be at least one family who did that. In spite of the odds of the situation with the crime, some families still open their hearts and their home to receive children like that. And their stories were successful stories. So that is where I see the mercy of God. When you are attached to a child, when you know what it is to want to give a child love, and you open your heart to that child like God did for Israel, that is mercy. That's the mercy of God. Being established right here in our society today. So the third, how am I going for time, please? Good? Right. <laughs> the third example I'm looking at is third, third Isaiah. Third Isaiah was active after the exile when the Israelites were allowed to return to their homeland, Israel. Okay. They returned to Israel expecting that all the words of comfort and hope that second Isaiah had prophesied would come true. Second Isaiah told them this that God is going to do a new thing, he's going to create a second exodus for us to go back home. So they expected that life would be nice. But they got back to Israel, and what they found was just the opposite. Innumerable hardships, famine, which resulted in poverty, political infighting, social problems, economic problems, you name it, Israel was faced with it. And in that situation of desperation again, third Isaiah said, Yahweh, you're going to bring us this far to forget us? He, and he cried out and he said, Yahweh, in verse 8, six, um, he said, do not let your anger go too far and do not come and do not remember guilt forever. Isaiah was begging for mercy and forgiveness. God, please don't abandon us. Don't forget us. Don't let your anger, Lord Jesus, strike out on us. And God answers again with a word of hope. They were asking God to work unexpected miracles to come down up to open the heavens. And God come down and work unexpected miracles. And instead, what God did was God gave them a word of comfort. The word comfort appears three times in that one verse. It says, you will be suckled again, carried on her hip, and fondled in her lap. As a mother comforts a child, so I shall comfort you. You will be comforted in Jerusalem. So that Isaiah again, third Isaiah, is using that image of a mother comforting her children. Again, to boost their morale, to strengthen them, to help them to continue to live out in their situation that they had found themselves in when they returned to their homeland. And you know, I don't know if any of you here have ever experienced a dark night of the soul. When you are going through a period of that darkness, let me tell you, any communication from God is mercy. Whether it is a word that God comforting you through a word, whether it is a touch, whether it is a presence, whether it is an action that is a miracle, any communication from God when you're going through such an experience is mercy. Because when God really communicates with you through whatever means, a word, a touch, a presence, immediately you feel that joy, that presence, and that you can continue to go. No matter the circumstances Israel found herself in, she would be able to continue and God will continue to carry her. Just like God carries us today. And that mercy of God today, you know where I see it? 
My husband and I were involved with a young man during Arik, confirmed cooking Arik. And because of that, we attended, we were part of any meetings, by along with San Fernando, family support groups, we were there. And you know what? Those mothers, the majority of the people present at those meetings, particularly the family support meetings once a month in San Fernando, the mothers, the women. And in spite of the fact that these boy children and girl children promising their parents, mommy, this is the last of the drugs. They would, by that time, we had gone through three rehab programs for this young man. Iparo, one in Carnage, one in Kuba, you name it. But you know what? Those mothers don't give up. One mother said, Miss, I was really hoping this nine months program with Iparo would have done it. But the day he came out, he went to look for the pusher. The mother didn't give up. All the mothers who were present, they don't give up. In spite of the promises, the false promises of by Sharon that they would give it up, the mothers, the hurt, the pain, the trauma, the brokenness that these families go through, not just the mothers, the entire family, because of their habits. But you know what? They don't give up. Month after month, I would see them again at these meetings. All the sun going, but he's still there, still going to the free pusher, but they're not giving up. That is God's news. God didn't say, because you abandoned me, I abandoned you, not because you lied to me, I will, I will get back at you and judge you. Ah, mercy is when we ask God to withhold judgment and instead grant us forgiveness. The, the, the judgment that we deserve, you know, but the forgiveness that we don't deserve, but God still gives us it. That is mercy. That is the mercy of God, and that is the kind of mercy that I see manifested and displayed in the parents who continually come month after month to these meetings and support their daughters and their sons in spite of the fact that they know that the lies, they will still go back to the pusher. So, you know, the mercy of God is still ongoing in all of these family members who come out to support. So, my last, how am I going for time? How many minutes do I have? How many, Father? Yeah, and they'll use it. Okay, the last one won't take too long. The last one is the crowning manifestation of God's mercy. You know what the catechism says, the Catholic catechism says about Christ? He said, for it was from the side of Christ as he slept the sleep of death upon the cross that there came forth the wondrous sacrament of the church. The church was born from the pierced heart of Christ hanging dead on the cross. No, this is the essence of God's mercy. This is the core of God's mercy that Christ gave birth to all of us, the church, okay? And in the, um, the, the um, birth of indiction of the year of Jubilee of mercy in article one says that Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy. Mercy has become living and visible in Jesus of Nazareth, reaching its culmination in him. And finally it says, Jesus of Nazareth from that same document, Jesus of Nazareth, his words, his actions, and his entire person reveals the mercy of God. If you want to know the mercy of God, embrace Jesus Christ. Receive him as your Lord and Savior, and I can guarantee you, you will never find mercy in greater amounts, in deeper depth than the mercy we receive from Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. My lecture this evening will be the Saints in Mercy. According to Pope Francis, in his letter on the extraordinary Jubilee year of mercy, he states that Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy to us, his children. For Jesus himself said in John 49, that whoever sees me sees the Father. 
Jesus Christ by his words, deeds, and his life on earth revealed the mercy of God to all people. The opening year of this mercy begins on the 8th of December 2015 of the solemn feast of the Immaculate Conception. For that day also coincided with the 50th anniversary of the closing of Vatican II, the second ecumenical council of the church. And it's also important to remember the words of St. John the 23rd as it pertains to mercy when he said, Now the bride of Christ wishes to use the medicine of mercy rather than taking up arms of severity. He issued this statement to us as the path for the church to follow in its mission to the world. The Jubilee year will close on the solemn feast of Christ on the 20th of November 2016. And it is to be remembered that God and his mercy endures upon us forever, as Psalms 136 reminds us. And as his children, we are always under the merciful gaze of our Father. Teresa White, commenting on mercy, tells us that words such as serenity, peace, joy, generosity, patient, patience, and faithfulness are words that bring us into the realm of God. For these words assist us to ponder on the metaphysical realities of our existence as human beings. Yet mercy encompasses all these words. And for Pope Francis, mercy can be described in this way. It is the bridge that connects God and man, opening our hearts to a new hope of being loved forever despite our sinfulness. In this lecture on the saints in mercy, I will attempt to highlight how both the Roman Catholic and Anglican faiths have lived out mercy in a concrete way through individuals and initiatives to the less fortunate of the world. The saints in mercy conjures up the countless Christians who have demonstrated divine mercy in the way that they have related to their fellow human beings and have officially been recognized by the church for this action. Pope Francis wrote again, our prayers extends to the saints and blessed ones who have made divine mercy their mission in life. For Pope Francis, these saints, when confronted with the commandment to love God and their neighbor, acknowledge the mystery of the incarnation, and by so doing, they entered into the depths of mercy. The saints, by seeing Jesus Christ as their model of mercy, were able to live out the great commandment of loving God and their neighbor in a concrete way. For it was Jesus who granted them the ability to show mercy in the first place. For when we show mercy, we are like the Good Samaritan that we ought to be to our brothers and sisters who have fallen by the wayside. For it was Jesus himself who was a Good Samaritan to us in the first instance. James Keenan wrote that the scandal of mercy should exclude no one, and therefore mercy is our willingness to enter into the chaos of another human being. Keenan cites the parable of the Good Samaritan, according to Luke 10, 29-37, as a portrait of mercy that expresses the love thy neighbor command par excellence. For this parable is really about our own redemption as human beings by a merciful and loving God. Therefore, when we speak about the saints in mercy, we speak about those individuals who have done the following as Saint Faustina, who found joy in showing mercy. Born in 1905 to 1938, she was a Polish nun who wrote out messages of mercy that she received from our Lord Jesus Christ in a diary. She wrote that there is a need for mercy and we need to reflect on mercy. She wrote that in the sacrament of reconciliation, the greatest of miracles takes place. For it is here that the miracle of divine mercy restores our soul in full. For in God, there is no loss. She wrote that she wanted to be completely transformed into the loving reflection of God's mercy and that mercy should pass from her soul to her neighbors. St. Faustina wrote, May my eyes and ears and tongue, hands and feet all be merciful. 
For true rest resides in the service of my neighbor. St. John Vianney, 1786 to 1859, he had a ministry of mercy and used to say, a good shepherd, a pastor after God's heart is the greatest treasure the good Lord can grant a parish and is one of the most precious gifts of divine mercy. For St. John Vianney, God was like the mother who was holding the child in her arms and does not mind the ill treatment or even the foolishness of the child. He would preach, it is not the sinner who returns to God, but it is God who runs after the sinner to return to him. The Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, she showed mercy for the least among us. Mother Teresa, she was also known, 1910 to 1997, dedicated her life to the works of mercy to the poorest of the poor. To her, the poor was her community. Their health and security was her way of doing God's will for them. She told her assistants and fellow sisters, do you see the priest how he treats the body of Christ? With such love and tenderness, do the same to the poor and the dying when you visit their homes. For you will discover Jesus disguised in their pain. You will discover Jesus in their pain. St. Camillus, 1550 to 1614, recognized the suffering face of Jesus. He used contemplation on Jesus to show and live out divine mercy. For he wanted his volunteers to treat the poor again as a mother treats a child. For him, the sick people of this world were the heart and the apple of the eye of God. And therefore, what we do to the poor, we do to God himself. For St. Kamalas, our Lord Jesus was never an ideal, a cause or a cause of action. But for him, being a loving presence to the poor under his care was as if it was Christ himself he was actually caring for. He recognized the suffering face of Jesus. St. Jerome showed mercy for the little ones. He was born into nobility in Venice, but being mindful of the cries of the poor and the needy, and by selling all his material possessions, using the money to look after the needs of the poor, the sick, and even the burial of the dead who were left abandoned on the streets and alleyways of Venice. For this he entered into the depths of mercy. He also looked after children and educated them, built a school for those little ones with the motto being prayer, charity, and work. And for these, the works of mercy, he was known as the vagabond of God. St. Jerome in his final years also founded a religious order known as the Company of the Servants of the Poor. And for this, he is remembered as having shown true mercy to the little ones. Elizabeth of Hungary used her wealth at the service of mercy. Born in 1207 and died in 1231, she lived a very short but rich life, for it was rich indeed, it was rich in mercy. Although of royal birth, she was a firm believer in what St. Francis of Assisi preached and his ideals. She began by building a hospital for the poor, the sick and the beggars near her castle. And all were welcome. She was canonized four years after her death at the age of 24. And she was known as the patroness of Catholic charities and was also the patron saint of the widows, the orphans, the sick, the beggars and the suffering. For her acts of mercy to the poor and others, she became known as the saint of justice. And this one is close to my heart. Saint Elizabeth, or Blessed Elizabeth Mora, she was a most merciful spouse. Born in 1774 and died in 1825, she was beatified in 1994 for her act of mercy and being a merciful spouse. Born of noble birth and married to a prominent attorney, married life was a fairy tale for Elizabeth at the outset. For her husband would soon become jealous of her because of her beauty. 
And if you see an image of her, you can see why she was truly a beautiful woman. And he became a womanizer and a gambler, which would lead to the distress that Elizabeth felt for the rest of her life. After feeling rejected by her husband, Elizabeth was sustained by the mystical union that was formed with Christ through prayer, vision, and rapture. She devoted her time to caring for the poor, and by doing the traditional works of mercy, Elizabeth became, Elizabeth's home became an authentic church, for her heavenly bridegroom had personally intervened in her life, and the miracles were innumerable. For she even prayed that her husband and his mistress would come to an experience of the incarnation in their lives, which she termed their Christmas Eve. Could you imagine that? She even prayed for the mistress of her husband. In time, Elizabeth died in peace, and after a short while, the, mi the mistress of her husband also died. But Elizabeth prayed that when she was alive, that her husband's mistress, when she died, would be with her in heaven. Mercy. That is mercy, my brothers and sisters. It would be nine years after the death of her husband. Sorry, it would be nine years after her death. And after 11 years of remorse and penance, died also a saint according to reputation. For he had also come to know and experience the incarnation. Yes, brothers and sisters, he had received his Christmas Eve as his wife hoped and prayed that one day he would receive this. The Anglican Church also celebrates the victory of Christ in the lives of particular individuals in our communion of the saints. And they are remembered for a number of reasons. Some for reverent remembrance, and some for their heroic struggle for the church. We also have the names of individuals who because of their lives reflect the mystery of Christ through reconciliation and mercy. Even in this month of May, we celebrate saints like Athanasius, Augustine of Canterbury, Julian of Norwich, the Venerable Bede, Dunstan, Archbishop of Canterbury, just to name a few. Archbishop Desmond Tutu has stated that forgiving and being reconciled to our enemies or our loved ones is not about pretending that things are other than they are. It is not about patting one another on the back and turning a blind eye to the wrong. True reconciliation exposes the awful, the abuse, the hurt, and the truth, because in the end, only an honest confrontation with reality can bring real healing. Superficial reconciliation can bring only superficial healing. According to our Anglican Communion, reconciliation is about our relationship with God and each other. For reconciliation involves people, communities, and nations learning to live together with deeply held differences. Therefore, reconciliation is really about working for justice and seeking truth in light of God's mercy and peace. For this is at the heart of the Christian gospel. Our current Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, believes that reconciliation is the hallmark of our Anglican faith and is actively promoting and pursuing initiatives that pertain to reconciliation and mercy within the Anglican communion. And they are, firstly, the Indaba principle, and secondly, the living reconciliation. Indaba is a Zulu word describing the process of reconciliation in controversial matters that may take a long period to solve. The Archbishop of Cape Town, South Africa, Tabo Makuba, commended Indaba to the Anglican Communion in the belief that the African way of handling conflict could bring about new reconciliation and mercy. Such processes are common throughout Africa, Asia, the Pacific Islands, and the, the, and the indigenous peoples of the Americas. One such case or area where Indaba has been used and successful to bring about reconciliation and mercy is in the African country of Zambia, where political violence threatened the stability of that country in recent time. The aim of continuing Indaba is to enable Anglicans worldwide to live out reconciliation by facing our own conflicts, 
to celebrate our diversity and differences, and so to become agents of God reconciling mission in the world. Parishes, dioceses, and provinces using continuing in Daba have reported that there have been a deeper energizing power to do mission, greater commitment to service and justice, as well as an increase in church growth. All these contribute, my brothers and sisters, to reconciliation and mercy in our world. Living reconciliation is a challenge for us all to be agents of mercy. It's a complex idea to define, but it's understood in the way we use our Christian narratives or stories. For the greatest story of reconciliation is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This great victory was confirmed by the coming of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and lives within the church and throughout human history. Reconciliation, again, is at the heart of our gospel. It is not an action, but a way of life. One of our successes of living reconciliation is the recent celebration of 50 years of work in Northern Ireland by the Anglican Church and other communities there who work actively to seek real peace and reconciliation in areas that are so torn apart. In our own local diocese of Trinidad and Tobago, the Anglican Church has been a beacon of mercy to the less fortunate since 1815. With the establishment of the St. Mary's Home for Children at Takarigua, started by the then Reverend Richards, who observed the plight of children of the indentured workers on the estate and decided that they had to be cared for. The original name of that home was the Takarigua Kuli Orphan Home, and initially had nine occupants. At the Synod of 1886, a board of managers was formed to take over the responsibility of managing the home. And in 1945, the Social Welfare Department took charge of the home, with its highest occupancy reaching 504 occupants in 1975. At present, the home has to deal with children between the ages of 3 to 19, both male and female, with issues that stem from disorderly conduct, mental disorder, serious emotional disturbance, or SED, physical challenges, at-risk children, juvenile delinquency, and criminology. These are the areas where mercy is shown and has to be shown by the church, by mentors, corporate sponsors, volunteers, individuals, and even the justice system, which all have a part to play. Therefore, mercy is indeed needed and if we are hoping to build the spiritual capacity in these children, it is important that we understand community support and succession planning is also important. According to Emily Stipson, mercy is not an idea, it is an action, it is a virtue. It is something meant to be lived every day by all who call Jesus Christ the Son of God. Jesus made himself, made himself clear that in Matthew 25, the tip, Matthew 25, verses 35 and following, when he promised eternal life to those who feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, and visit those in prison. Truly, I say to you, Jesus said, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Finally, brothers and sisters, both the Roman Catholic and the Anglican faiths have shown mercy in an active and concrete way as they have endeavored to live out the commandment of love thy neighbor to the less fortunate of the world. As stated earlier by the Bishop of Rome, Pope Francis has said, this year of mercy should exclude no one. And why? Mercy became important when Jesus our Lord and Savior commanded it to us to be just like him. For we need to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, shelter the homeless, clothe the naked, visit the sick, visit the imprisoned and bury the dead. For all these ways, we enter into mercy just as the saints did. We also need to understand that as people forgiven and shown mercy by a loving God, we are to imitate Jesus Christ, showing mercy to the most forgotten, the most shamed, the most excluded in society. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, let us remember what the Bishop of Rome has stated to us earlier, that Jesus Christ, 
is the face of the Father's mercy to us, his children. Thank you. The title of my talk here today is The Trimbegonian Catholic Church, A Church in Need of Mercy. I know it's a curious title, but we'll go ahead and see why. This year, for the first time in some years, Peter Minchel gifted our carnival with his creativity. His carnival king, Raj Najinsky, graced the stage with a portrayal of Anna Pavlova's The Dying Swan. Not everyone was happy though. Um, soon there were descending voices of disapproval and noted com content for this portrayal. One, it was not pretty enough. Second, it was offensive for a portrayed a man in drag. Three, it was not carnival enough. Despite this, the costume somewhat triumphed since it still came third in the Carnival Kings competition and had immense crowd approval. Much of the dissatisfaction came out of the ridiculously high placing, one of the critics said. How can this Moko Jambi be exalted above our hard work, our expenses, and our tastes? Why is this called mass? This led to the columnist Martin Daly to remark that the rejection of Minchel's costume was reflective of the level of divisiveness in our society and the contempt for valid mass traditions. I start here because I found the controversy surrounding Minchel's costume was a powerful archetype of the drama of mercy we face in our church. If we substitute the actors in this scenario, the crisis we are facing becomes clearer. For instance, if we were to substitute Minchel with God, Rasnajinsky <laughs> with, say, a pedophile or a murderer or anybody deserving of rejection, the judges and the crowd who lauded the work of as God's saintly court, the critics with the righteous, and the mass with our shared humanity. Then it would be safe to say that like the critics of this fiasco, when we put on the hat of judge, we foolishly believe that we are better at judging humanity than God himself. In so doing, we critics have lost sense of the genius of God's creation in our obsession to fit the sinners of unspeakable sins into the moles of unpardonable sins we have created for them. Like the critics, having failed to see the ugly that our celebration of mass has become, we have lost sight of the fact that our own efforts at making humanity better are neither restoring anyone's faith in humanity, nor inspiring persons to do like us. Like the critics we are, we put our own righteousness on a pedestal, but not thinking for one moment that it too is imperfect and needs to be subject to validation from God, who alone could understand the depths of our effort in the light of his mercy. His mercy, this gift, gift helps us recognize the beauty within us and validates it, it with the standards that are not fully clear to us critics. I call this the, um, the mystery of, of mercy. Unfortunately, we critics see his standard as ridiculous and clearly misdirected. So much so that we reject the beauty still present, tattered, sometimes dying before us, unsightly to our standards, and are prepared to rubbish it away and destroy it with our gossip. This beauty is the image of God, and it cannot be discerned with a hermeneutic of judgment, of human judgment. In this discussion, I hope to highlight some of the essential features of mercy as elicited in the Christian understanding, and retrieve the building blocks of a hermeneutic of mercy, a means of interpreting our problems and throwing the light of merciful reflection on them. I contend that our habitual propensity to render judgment upon others in contempt, rather than to confront their sinfulness as a people who have received God's mercy, is at the heart of why the church lacks credibility. In essence, contemptuous judgment has taken root in our ministry, preaching and worship, and only a hermeneutic of mercy 
can bring forth a renewal in our mission as church that is effective and fruitful. The sin of judging others. Before I embark on the discussion of mercy, I wish to first draw my attention to the sin of judging others. Now you'd notice that I have labeled it a sin. This is not helped by the fact that the sacred scripture says in one breath, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Luke chapter 6 verse 37. While a few chapters later, the scripture seems to command us to judge where it says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Luke chapter 12 verse 57. Are we then to judge not, judge or not? You see a helpful distinction between what I am calling sin and what we are called to do for our brothers and sisters in love was made by one of the early church fathers, St. John Chrysostom. In his homily on the Lord's command not to judge, St. Chrysostom said that it is important not to correct a sinner as an enemy exacting a penalty, but as a physician providing medicine. He said that Christ does not forbid judging, but commands you first to take out the log from your own eye. For St. John, the rationale for this distinction is that the prohibitions against judging were meant to save us from pharisaical self-righteousness, from a spiritual blindness which can see all sins except our own. The warnings about pharisaical uh, self-righteousness was helpfully illustrated in the gospel narratives. And just a disclaimer, um, this is not a father anal taught exegesis that I learned in the seminary that I'm about to give us, so don't, don't crucify me, okay? So I recall two gospel parables and one Jesus encounter that illustrates spiritual blindness succinctly. The unmerciful servant. The first is the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. Jesus was asked by his disciples how many times they should forgive a sinner. What was the answer? Well, a parable, you know, Jesus will not answer history. So this particular servant pleaded to the master for patience in repaying his debt. And of course, the master forgave the whole debt, having pity on the servant, and he let the servant go on his merry way. On the servant's turn now, when someone else owed him a debt, his own reaction was vulgar, forceful, and violent. What else he did? He had his debtor thrown into prison until that debt was met. Well, unfortunately for the servant, his peers saw this hypocrisy, went back to the master, and told him what the servant did. He admonished him and decided to throw him in prison and have him tortured until the debt was paid. On reflection, we can see that this man's own condemnation of another became his own sentence. The Heavenly Father will treat each of you like this unless you forgive a brother or sister from your heart, Jesus says. The second parable is the one of the Pharisee and the tax collector. This occurs in Luke 18. The Pharisee in the temple approaches the altar and says, God, thank you, I'm not like these people. I fast and give tithes, he, had. he adds. Meanwhile, a tax collector just behind him prays, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We are told of the tax collector's disposition the fact that he beat his chest and did not even look up. The tax collector ends up justified before God rather than the Pharisee, Jesus says. All those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted, exalted, says Jesus. These two parables relate to us two types of sin. The sin of self-referential righteousness and the sin of the forgiven but merciless sinner and the behaviors associated with both. Finally, there's the encounter of the thieves on the cross with the crucified Jesus. In Luke's gospel tradition, the unrepentant criminal says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Note his lack of acceptance for his punishment. Note the mockery of Christ's power. Don't you fear God? Asks the penit penitent thief to the unrepentant thief. Note that this closely resembles a profession of faith. This thief, unlike his cohort, makes no excuses for his punishment, 
which he acknowledges as deserved according to his deeds. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, he says. Christ has done nothing wrong. Notice the humility in accepting his fate. Notice his recognition of the unjust treatment of the other that, who suffers like him. Note his openness to what Jesus has to offer. This is a mercy repetition. It is a model which all gestures of mercy, I believe, should find its shape. I would like to summarize some of the principles from these passages that will provide us at least a beginning for our hermeneutic of mercy. This list is not meant to be exhaustive, it's just a start. Mercy is never automatic. It must be accepted by the one in need. It presupposes freedom to accept or reject God's saving mercy. God offers, and it is for us to accept. Two, judging others in contempt is linked to pride. I am righteous, he's a sinner. I am blessed and must be rewarded accordingly. He is not blessed and must suffer accordingly. Mercy is not antinomian. By this I mean mercy does not preclude the necessity for law. Rather to understand mercy, we must acknowledge the role of God's law in our lives. How can we become merciful if we do not recognize our own sins? Moreover, how can our brothers and sisters correct their behavior without a rule or measure for understanding their own imperfection? Four, mercy does not mean the absence of rebuke. Rather, rebuking is directed towards the sin. To help your brother recognize that sin is harming him and his community. This is not done out of contempt. This is not done out of exacting vengeance and taking delight in the sinner's suffering, but a desire to see the sinner healed. Mercy is found in humility, not in selfishness. Stanley Har Harawas, a famous American theologian, says, it is not possible for us to see what is in our eye because the eye cannot see itself. That is why we are able to see ourselves only through the vision made possible by Jesus. Number six, mercy does not mean the absence of punishment. Mercy takes effect in the heart of someone who accepts just punishment. The sick cannot be healed without accepting mercy, the mercy offered freely in spite of his or her transgressions. Helplessness is a precondition for mercy. We must acknowledge it wherever we are in life, even if blessed abundantly. We are helpless, vulnerable, and the mercy at the mercy, and at the mercy of others. Eight, mercy is intercessory and forgiving. No burden is insurmountable for the healing power of mercy. St. John Paul II said, by forgiving his, execu um, his executors, Jesus showed he is not the accuser of the guilty, but rather the advocate and intercessor. Jesus' words of forgiveness, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, were spoken in circumstances of the greatest hatred and cruelty. Jesus forgives his adversary, adversaries um, immediately, even as their hostility continues. Mercy is an act of faith. All of Christ's ministry, activity, prayers, and deeds are rooted in mercy. A person of faith cannot heal the sick without first accepting the mercy of Christ and recognizing his or her own sinfulness. We do mercy because we hope in salvation. And finally, mercy has no limits. It is available to all, even the condemned. Pope Francis in his letter for the year of mercy said that if God limited himself to only justice, he would cease to be God. I would instead be like human beings who ask merely that the law be respected. But mere justice is not enough. Experience shows that an appeal to justice alone will result in justice's destruction that have forced the public to take note. I will focus on three such incidents that lit up social media recently. Exhibit one, a self-employed man allegedly caught with two young female minors unspeakable acts committed against them. Grief for the family of the abused. The abuser's actions are rightfully condemned by the public. But the abuser? Well, burn him, kill him, waste a space in prison. I hope he's dealt with prison in more ways than one. I hope he kills himself. How can you watch a child and do that? If that was my child, I ask you as church, going back to our archetype, 
Are you a critic? Is this person a dying swan? If he is not, what should become of him? Should he be put to death? Is there space for him in the pews? Can the power of mercy redeem him? Can you grant him mercy? Exhibit 2. A young man and popular party promoter, a known ladies man, is publicly outed by a sex video of him participating in homosexual acts. Burn him. Sick. Worse than a normal homosexual because he's under law. Make him famous. <coughs> Somebody saw me the video now. After watching it. Yeah, 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 he's sick. What a waste of a handsome man. I ask again, church, are you a critic? Is this person a dying swan? If he is not, what should become of him? Is there space for him in our pews? Can you pray for him without a pharisaical self-righteousness? Can you grant him mercy? Exhibit 3, a public figure accused of rape. Incident happens at an upscale hotel and in a private room. Of the victim I ask, are you a critic? Is this person a dying swan? If she is not, what would become of her if this is a false allegation? Is there space for her in the pews? Can you pray for her without a pharisaical self-righteousness? Can you grant her mercy? Can you forgive her? And the same goes for the accused. If it proves true that he raped her, can we answer these questions? I say this because I'm gonna check the time again. I say this because, like it or not, social media has provided a new stage for judging our mass, our humanity. And while its effects are deliriously powerful, social media is threatening governments, leading to resignations of public figures, and providing the most salacious details backed up by credible evidence. It is a forum unlike any other seen in human history. But unlike the sacred sp spaces we experience in society, there's no filter, there's no body language that belies the true sentiments of another. Rather, we have naked thoughts, committed to writing, malicious accusations, and condemnatory speech. Social media is the new crucifixion. Sadly, the church has been somewhat silent in its message of mercy an approach of mercy on this forum. When I say church, I use it in, in its universal sense, institutional leadership and the laity. In fact, the church by its omissions and often by its actions has facilitated this murder by gossip and condemnatory speech. Who do you think is making people famous? Likewise, this hermeneutic of judgment has taken root in the ver very fabric of church ministry and worship. Like the tax collector in the parable, like the critics in our dying sworn archetype, self-referential righteousness is manifested in our sacred spaces. This year of mercy calls us to an examination of conscience, recognizing our need as a church for mercy. Too often, problems of our society are framed as external problems that, affects, that affect us as church. Today, I suggest that we reframe the problems as our own in order to become a merciful church. This year of mercy for the church is not a simple call for conversion to God, but a call to the church to recover the lost dimension of the commandment to love, that is, to love our neighbor as ourselves. This year of mercy is a call to live our commandment and more so to recognize it in our own new context beyond the concerns of masses and servants or tax collectors and Pharisees. This is a new stage. Specifically, I would like to make a brief evaluation of how we approach liturgy by using the building blocks of a hermeneutic of mercy elicited earlier to suggest a new disposition that acknowledges our own sinfulness so as to become justified before God. I'm almost done, sorry. Um, a Eucharistic celebration that emphasizes worship to God and loses sight of the commandment to love our neighbor is evidence of pharisaical self-righteousness. Too many Catholics are desensitized to the call to go in peace to love and serve the Lord. It explains why many are content with going to Mass for communion and indifferent to the concerns of the members who make up the parish community. 
It explains why prayer for sacrifice can stop at communion or observance of an hour of adoration, but indifferent to the circumstances that, requ that require people to observe the prayerful needs of individual members. Furthermore, there is the problem of consuming the Eucharist and not having a deep sense of our unworthiness. I recall my first ever visit to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in Aruka. In their liturgical prayer before communion, it carries worshippers through a thorough examination of conscience collectively before persons go to the table. Such prayer emphasizes that having resentment towards their neighbor while coming to the table is no cure for their unrighteousness. A Eucharistic celebration grounded in the humanitic of mercy does not lose sight of the other. And why does our hospitality stop at the liturgy? Self-referential righteousness is evident when we place emphasis on people who come to us rather than the people whom we should go meet. Our parishes have operated on a premise that sinners must come to the church rather than the church come to sinners. Even in our celebration of newcomers and equally of regulars, we seem indifferent to the fact that we do not know our fellow parishioners by name or by their particular concerns. A hermeneutic of mercy requires a meaningful hospitality, a hospitality of encounter and sacrifice. It requires the people of God to develop solidarity and charity for the other. It extends the bond of kinship to strangers who do not share blood relation with the Christian. Mercy requires us to know our neighbor's plight. Go further than a cursory greeting and a parting gift. It means seeking out and ensuring their needs are met. It means knowing who they are and by name, who they are by name, calling them when they are absent. It means listening before admonishing. When our intercessory prayer is only directed to victims and those who suffer violence and neglects those who inflict such pain, then this is, an inadequate, this is inadequate in the context of mercy. As Christians, we are called by the Lord himself to love and pray for our enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. What are we saying about the power of God when we ignore that those who commit evil are in need of love and prayer too? What if God held back his mercy to us, so-called more deserving of his mercy sinners? If we cannot offer mercy to the least deserving, why then do we profess on our lips the mercy of God? Is it a convenient mercy? Preaching that ignores the suffering of the poor or fails to recognize who the poor is, is crying out for a humanitic of mercy. St. Oscar Romero reminds us that a preaching that says nothing about the sinful environment in which the gospel is reflected upon is not the gospel. The preaching church must see indifference to suffering as an evil to be eradicated. Preaching must cut to the heart of the matter, name the disease, and illustrate actions of the heart. Preaching with a hermeneutic of mercy draws from the scriptures, especially from the gospels. The Christian duty to serve one another and interpret it anew with bold proposals for merciful living. As the martyred saint said, we cannot call a society, a government, or a situation Christian when our brothers and sisters suffer so much in those inveterate and unjust structures. God may be a trini, but we are no trinis. But to what end are we emphasizing mercy? I've chosen to stay limited to our way of worship rather than the traditional corporal works of mercy. I think ultimately, effective disciples of mercy must know how to worship mercifully, and once they do, their activity shall conform to it. I believe that the manifest violence is distracting us from the hidden violence that continues to fuel the destruction. The violence is present when we continue to remain indifferent to all forms of corruption, many of us are guilty of, when we are prepared to use patronage, wealth, and influence to serve our ends over others. Mercy calls, for, calls us first to stop being indifferent to the plight of the oppressed and the poor and work towards correcting injustices in society. It requires us to courageously name the sin and to lay down our lives as peacemakers, as the merciful who has experienced mercy. This is the mercy that is audacious enough 
to forgive even the greatest sins, greatest of sins, and to not condemn anyone who is rightfully punished for committing evil acts. Furthermore, furthermore, mercy means that we have accepted that God saves. Pope Francis in a, in a general audience said that if I feel I am righteous, there is no saving relationship between I the sinner and the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, the dying swan is in need of mercy. The dying swan is a sinner like all of us. Her sin, no doubt, no doubt appears unsightly. But she wants to continue to delight, to celebrate, to show us it still has much to offer. And most importantly, she desires to live another day to show us her beauty, her humanity. The swan's final dance is a plea for mercy. Her dance is a confirmation that she still has beauty to offer. The audacity to perform in her condition is a cry for relevance, for acceptance. Let us not condemn her ugliness. Let us join her in dance with the understanding that her steps are, are her own and our steps are our own. Let us recognize our own finality, our own need, of, need for mercy. Let us dance and wash our garments in the presence of our Creator. Pope Francis says of the sinful woman who was forgiven by Jesus that she teaches us the connection between faith, love, and recognition. Many sins were forgiven her, and there she has loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. May the good Lord see our beauty, frail but elegant, like the tax collector behind the Pharisee. May each of us pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Thank you. Last week, Friday, I was driving, going somewhere. They said that there were five murders between one evening and the following day. In a matter of a week, more than 13 murders. And what is surprising and what really affects me when I listen to the news is that it's mentioned so casually and they go on to the next news item. You know, I don't know if, if you understand what I'm trying to say. There's so much corruption in high places in government, in business, in private sector, in public sector. There are so much indignities to human, human life right now. So many rapes, and we, we're not hearing about it unless we ask for the statistics. So many cases of incest, which are reported. What about those that are not reported? Pedophilia, homosexuality, bullying in schools and homes. Injustices such as domestic abuse, inequality in the workplace with respect to gender, wrongful detention in our prisons, some persons who have not been tried, their cases have not been called, for over 10 years they have been serving in remand, we do, and we are not even sure whether they are innocent or guilty, they are innocent until proven guilty, but there has been no proof of guilt. Human sickness with respect to human suffering with respect to illness, unemployment, recession, whether it is recession or stagnation or economic decline, the possibility of refugees from our neighboring countries, the culture of death, the rampant culture of death with respect to abortion, the way we treat our, treat our elderly, respect for life, respect for each other, the way husbands treat wives, the way wives treat husbands, the way children treat parents, the way we treat our elderly again. And I could go on and on. There are cases where we have become so desensitized to death. It is of grave concern to us, it should be of grave concern to us who call ourselves Christians. The passing of a human life is mentioned and, and then when we hear of, of, for example, I go back to the two young men, the two young school children who were murdered some months ago. And to hear, and, and when we read social media, going back to some of the points that Naira made, when you read some of the comments on social media where people are saying it's good for them, you know, it's good for them, how can you think of two teenagers being murdered and say it's good for them because of the area they came from. It is just assumed that they were involved in some sort of nefarious activity. And whether they were involved in activity or not, a human life, to, to think that we have reached a stage where we can say the loss of life, it, it is good. 
So the dignity of life, the dignity of human life, is no longer recognized. And I'm making this, in a gen this statement in a general context. Recently, with the, the Zika virus and the health minister making his contribution, where he uh, ended the discussion on abortion. And next thing you know, the whole of society, most of society, was up in arms about the right of the woman to abort a child. So these things bring, bring sig this send signals to us of where we are as a society, where we are in need of mercy. Mercy seems to be out of place. We can ask ourselves, how can we as Christians demonstrate mercy in all of this? Is mercy out of context? As Christians, is mercy a figment of our imagination? Is mercy just relatable to naive persons who believe in a God who himself is out of context for our time? A God who is virtually real only to dreamers? Mercy has now been relegated by society to a secular domain. For example, you find mercy and death in the same sentence. So there's mercy killing. There's euthanasia, abortion, capital punishment, where we call for the life of someone who has committed crime. We want the necks of our gangsters. They shouldn't be taking up space in the prison. It's time to hang them. And these are calls that are being done even from persons who call themselves Christians, persons who go to church. So what is the true meaning of mercy for us who are religious and from a religious and spiritual perspective? Well, for one thing, we live in a pluralistic society and most of the religions in this society we ascribe to a definition of mercy whose origin is divine. For example, the Hindus, they speak of Vishnu, the embodiment of mercy and goodness. The Muslims, they speak of Allah, the merciful. And as Christians, mercy is a virtue that orders our humanity. We speak of a God who is rich in mercy, a God whose mercy is infinite, a God whose mercy for us is so great that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to show us the face of mercy. Bishop Robert Barron, Bishop of California, he defines mercy as what love looks like when God looks at a sinner. And each of us can identify with the mercy of God. Throughout the scriptures, the Old and the New Testament, we have numerous examples of our merciful God, his nature. In the book of Exodus, it tells us that when the glory of God was passing before Moses, the word of God said, God who is rich in mercy. The book of Psalms, they go on and on about the infinite mercy of God. Psalm 136, his mercy endures forever. In the book of Exodus, again, when we read about our God, we read of a God who, despite the stubbornness of his people, a people who he loves so dearly, a people who turned away from him over and over again, a people who wandered in circles for 40 years, but yet despite all of their stubbornness, despite all of their complaining, despite of the many times they turned away from serving God, God continued to show his mercy. For 40 years, they were not in need of anything. They did not need to, check, to have their clothes or their shoes. Their shoes never wore out. How many of us have a pair of shoes that lasted us 40 years? Or a pair of garments that lasted us 40 years? That was the mercy of God to his people. He was a God who went before them as a pillar of light in the night and a, and a cloud in the day. He led the way to them. He protected them. He provided for them when they cried out for meat. He provided for them day, and, day in and day out. He provided water for them. Everything they asked for, our merciful God provided. In the New Testament, the fulfillment of God's mercy 
when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And by his incarnation, Jesus revealed God's mercy. He embodied God's mercy in person. He taught us that blessed are the merciful, for mercy shall be shown to them. He revealed the Father's mercy through his miracles, by his teachings, by his parables, by his healing ministry. He revealed that God's mercy is infinite, that there is hope, that God is love, rich in mercy. When he started his earthly ministry, Jesus said to us in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim an acceptable year, a year acceptable to the Lord. Jesus was the embodiment of God's mercy. He taught as the parable of the Good Samaritan, mercy immeasurable, shared freely without bias. He tells in practical ways how we can live out God's mercy. This stranger that the Samaritan met on the wayside, and we can bring it in our time. This man was laying on the wayside, a victim of bandits. And this stranger came upon him after a priest and a Levi passed, the other way, passed on the other side of the road. And this stranger shared his time and his money to make sure that this person was attended to. He taught us the parable of the prodigal son, or more so the story of a forgiving and merciful father. A son who asked for his inheritance before his father passed away and a son who felt it was fitting for him to return in order to share a meal with the servants in order for his survival. Jesus taught us that the father was waiting for the return of his son, looking out day by day for his son. And when the father saw his son, he ran to meet him. And with all that the son had rehearsed that he was going to say to his father, he never got the opportunity to say so. Because his father just called his servants and restored his son to his rightful place as son. And there was a big celebration for his return, a God who is rich in mercy. Along with Jesus' teachings, the scriptures tell us about, in the New Testament, the writings of St. Paul, the early church fathers. And what I like about St. Paul and his writings when we remember who Paul was before he became Paul, and, and his example is so fitting for our time, I, I think. Paul was a persecutor. Put it in modern day terms, Paul was a terrorist. Put it in modern day terms, Paul could have been a gangster. How many of us look at our, our terrorists, the terrorists who persecute our church today? and wish them dead. How many of us think of our gangsters on the hills and find they should all be killed? The government not doing anything about them. But Paul, who was formerly Saul, writes in Ephesians 2, 4 to 5, he said, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, and Paul wrote because of his experience of the mercy of God. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. And he went on to say, by grace, by grace, each of us, by grace, nothing else. By grace, you have been saved. By grace, I have been saved. The mercy of God. Nothing we have done, but because of God's grace. And because of God's grace and his infinite mercy to each one of us, we too have an obligation 
to develop a culture of mercy. It should be the rule of life for us in our community. It should be a rule of life for you and for me in our homes, in our church, in our nation. Mercy is love and service. We need to live love. We need to live service. We need to live forgiveness. We need to develop that culture of forgiving. Mercy is love in action. It's not just sitting down and saying, okay, I have been forgiven. I have received God's mercy and that's it. That's not what this year of mercy is about. It is going beyond that. We need to return mercy. We need to love and serve others without expecting anything in return. As Christians, we need to apply a new vision. We need to put on new spectacles. Spectacles that sees where the needs are in our nation. And to see with eyes of mercy. Be ready to use our gifts and our charisms. Each one of us, we have gifts and charisms. Be ready to use our gifts and charisms for the building of the church. For our nation, for our region, for the world. It's not just about complaining and, and wanting revenge for what has been wrong, but we can pray. We can pray for those who, are, who we think need to be converted. We can pray for our, brother, our brothers and sisters in prison. We can visit them. We can visit the sick. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. The message of the gospel is not just for us who sit in church. There are persons outside of church who are waiting to hear the message that God loves you. So many of our brothers and sisters have not come to be able to wrap their mind around the fact that there is a God who loves them. And if God loves them, we too, we too, love supposed to be part of, of how we feel for them. We don't have to like them, but we have to love. That's a command. And we need to take that message out there. We need to speak love to our brothers who, because they, it is love and acceptance and everything else that they, they are looking for. That they, they, they're searching for love in the wrong places. Uh, Someone like I was singing a song there, but that's not it. But it's a reality. And in searching in the wrong places, they get themselves involved in all sorts of activity. There are persons waiting to hear the message. God loves you. And we need to take this message to the byways. We need to take this message to the prostitutes who walk the streets. We don't just laugh at them or look at Murray Street. It's not about laughing at them. Because God is waiting for one person to come home. And, they said, and the word tells us that there is such rejoicing when one returns. And what are we doing? So be ready to move and shake, to explore new ways. As church, we need to look for the new ways that we can bring the message of the gospel out there. We continually need to challenge ourselves to develop a culture of mercy.